Well, good morning. Welcome. Um, I'm sure that we're expecting a few more on their way, but uh, why don't we go ahead and open up in prayer uh, as we present this uh, meeting unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, Father, we just thank you. We give praise to you, Lord, for even giving us this opportunity that we can gather together, that we can learn of you, that we can uh, learn from one another. And we ask, Lord, that uh, as you bring in those whom you want to be here, oh God, that, that we will form the group you want us to have and do the things you've called us to do. We pray for your leading, your anointing, your covering in all things. We give all praise to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, Tina has asked me to open up with just a short devotional, so I'll try to keep this short and sweet. Um, as I thought about it, uh, one of the Psalms that I went to um, that, that, that touched me at this moment was Psalm 45. If you have your Bibles, you can open to that. If not, I'm only going to read the first verse. Psalm 45 starts with uh, the psalm writer saying, My heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. Now the psalm writer is writing it for a king. It's a psalm of David, but it's written for a king's wedding. So it's a, a royal psalm and it's written at the time of a king's wedding. And the psalm writer is stirred, stirred with such emotion that um, he's literally boiling over with words that he wants to present to his king. But he likens his tongue to the pen of a ready writer. So since we're writers, I thought I would uh, sort of capitalize on that point, the pen of a ready writer. When you're a writer, if you're going to be a writer, if you're going to be a scribe, if you're going to be writing anything, composing something, you're going to have something nearby to you that's useful to you. The, the psalm writer was overcome with something that he wanted to so greatly put into words um, that his tongue, literally, he couldn't keep the tongue still. He wanted to compose this. So as writers, we want to have that same attitude. We want to have that same eagerness to put something down, uh, get it in writing and get it out. We do all believe, and I think I can speak for everybody here, that God has placed something inside of us and given us abilities to somehow put it on paper. Now, whether we're writing uh, our devotional, whether we're uh, our testimony, a devotional, teaching, um, fiction, whatever we're writing, we do believe that the Lord has dropped something inside of us, right? That we want to get out in one way or another, whether we're going to publish it in a magazine or publish it locally in our church or go big scale and <laughs> get our book on a bookshelf in a, in a bookstore, which is, I guess, what we would ultimately want. We need to have that mindset of having the pen of a ready writer and being prepared. So I thought about a few things. What is a ready writer? What is a ready writer? What are we as ready writers? Um, we're stirred. The psalm writer was stirred to write something. We're stirred. We're stirred with emotions because God drops that, that idea into us. We have a, a noble theme just like the psalm writer had. And I believe we are inspired by the noblest of all who, who can bring us uh, ideas and ways to present it. Um, and, and Tina taught on that. She taught on inspiration. You know, we have an inspiration that other people don't have. We have a divine inspiration, and that really matters. Also, we do a good work. It's, it's a good work. It's a good theme that we have. And it's good not because of how well we do it, but because it's a good thing that we're doing. Um, just when Paul said he had fought a good fight, he wasn't describing how well he fought it. He was describing the fight. Good modifies the fight. The fight was a good fight that he was fighting. What we write, we write a good thing. What we have in our hearts to write is a good thing to write. Hopefully we do it well. And I think the critiquing today is going to help us with that. That's, that's all in getting us to do it as skillfully as possibly, as, as possible. So we're stirred. Um, we're also skilled. We are skilled and we're, we're honing our skills. As we come here in a group like this today, it's to hone our skills. It's to learn from one another. It's to glean from one another. And what we do, we want to do skillfully unto the Lord. Um, the Bible tells us to do that. Everything we do, everything we set our, our hand to do, we want to do it with all our might and as unto the Lord. We're motivated. We're encouraged. We're supported. That's the whole point of this. You're in a group with other writers. You're going to meet other people that you might not, ha not have opportunity to communicate with. So it's an encouragement. It's a support group for writers. You feel uh, frustrated. You feel maybe you're in a dry season. You don't know what to do, but you can, you can pull off one another. 
when we gather together, just like a church, <laughs> just like a church. We don't want to forsake the assembling of ourselves together in a group like this because we are going to grow as writers and as a group. We're fluent. We should be fluent. A ready writer is fluent. The writer of the psalm was fluent. His words were spilling out of him. The, the, in the King James, it says, my heart is indicting a good matter. And that's an old English word. Well, it's a common word, but it, it means to compose or to write. But literally, it comes from a Hebrew word that means to bubble up or, or boil over. And don't you feel that way sometimes? Something is inside of you and it literally is bubbling up. You know, Jeremiah had a fire shut up in his bones, right? He couldn't contain it because when the Lord places it there, if you don't act upon it, it's going to find a way to manifest itself. So let's put it to the proper use to glorify God in the most. And uh, to be ready and to be prepared. A ready writer is obviously a prepared writer. Uh, one simple illustration, and then I'll come to a close. Uh, when I was in college, I took some art classes and, and the teachers would tell us, wherever you go, bring a sketchbook. Because as an art student, you always want to be sketching. So we walked around with these sketchbooks everywhere and we'd drop down and draw people and we'd draw things, whatever we saw. We were always drawing. And I submit to you that as a writer, you ought to be the same. Always thinking about what you're going to write. Because you'll walk out of here and you might um, see a scene unfolding in front of you and, and you're thinking, you know, how can I incorporate this? Or you'll see something in the physical and the Lord will remind you of a scripture that it illustrates. You might, sometimes I hear a name and my first thought is, boy, that would make a good character name. <laughs> you know, a good South Louisiana character name. But the Lord will prompt you on things like that. And since we are Christians and we're writing a good work, then we, we, want, it, we, want, it, we want it to be based on the Word of God. So I just want to end with this one scripture from 2 Timothy 4.2. It says, preach the Word, or in this case, write the Word, be instant in season and out of season, always being prepared to take down what you're seeing and figure out what God wants you to use it for in your writing. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You know, your writing uh, may be just an exhortation or it might be exhorting somebody. It might be a teaching somebody. It might be correcting. <laughs> it actually could be correction. But uh, in as much as the, the preached word can do all those things, so can the written word. So uh, whether we're, we're fiction, whether we're nonfiction, whether we're curriculum, we're submitting it all to God. And we want to have the pen of a ready writer and be prepared. Amen? All right. Well, I would like to introduce Tina Myers. Uh, Tina is, going, is uh, the coordinator of this, and she's going to come up here and teach on the art of the critique. Art of the critique. Thank you, Linda. That was uh, very encouraging and good information keep in mind. Before I um, get started on the art of the critique, I have a few announcements. Ingrid Adams, I don't know if many of you had a chance to talk to her at the last meeting, but we've appointed her as a board member at large. I've known Ingrid for many years. She belonged to the North Shore group. That's where I originally met her. And she is going to be helping us with the event we're planning in November. We have obtained a commitment from Sally Ann Roberts, Channel 4 News, to speak at the November event. Way ahead of time because <laughs> we haven't really planned the event beyond we're gonna have an event. <laughs> so I didn't even have a theme to give her, but she's definitely interested in coming. She's committed to coming. We're on her calendar. And in March, we're going to meet and start organizing that event. So if you have experience in organizing events and you would like to be kind of on a committee to offer your input and your talents towards that, you would be welcome to join us. Just let me know that you have an interest in that. Now, I want to let you know that attending these meetings are free. Everyone is welcome. But there are benefits to becoming a member. Membership forms are on the table along with a list of those benefits if you're interested. You can become a member at any meeting. We prorate the fee so that you are only paying for the remaining months of the year. If you join today, the fee will be $45. Payment can be made in cash, check, and we are now set up to receive credit card payments or debit cards. Next month, Erica Spindler, an international and New York Times best-selling author. She's been a New York Times best-selling author numerous times. 
will be with us. I asked her to join us because she mentioned to me that she'd like to enter the Christian market. She is a secular writer, but she has an interest in entering the Christian market. She just wasn't sure if the Christian market would accept her. <laughs> so I'm embracing her and saying, we accept you. <laughs> And she's going to come and she's now, and this is interesting because she's a very, very successful writer. And yet she's writing a series right now called The Light Keepers because she wanted to explore concepts of good and evil. And she's published, she is self-publishing. So if you think that you're an unknown author and the only path you have is self-publishing, they have famous authors who are published, self-publishing. You're not alone. The only advantage they have on us is they already have a big following. It gives her a, a little advantage that we don't have, but that doesn't mean we can't build a big following one day. She started with no following, right? So the last thing I wanted to tell you, we have a 30-second commercial. It's for social media. I was not able to put it up here because it wouldn't accept the wire and we didn't bring the plug-in wire. Do we have the plug-in wire? Oh, it works with yours? Okay. Well, maybe we'll show it to you at the end. If not, you can go to scwguild.com and see that 30-minute commercial. You can go to the web page on the Facebook. It's pinned to the top. You can see the commercial. It, the, those who have seen it said it's very well done and it looks professional. And the reason I'm telling you that, more than that there's a commercial, is how I got it. Because years ago I had, went, I had asked Channel 20 what it would cost to promote, promote pr produce a 30 second commercial. And it came out to about $350 just to produce it. And then you had to buy the airtime. Well, there is a website called Fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R.com. And what it is, it's freelancers, and they do everything. And a lot of them are professional people who were in the industry at one time. Maybe they're retired. They want to make a little extra money. I think that's the gentleman that I used was in that category. That's why we got such a great commercial. But that commercial only cost me $75. And it, if I had written the script, it would have been $60. But I went ahead and figured he's a professional. I'll give him the information. It was only $15 for him to write the script. So I got the whole thing for $75, and I can blast it on social media for free, right? <laughs> so, I mean, and they, the people on there, now they're worldwide. I also had a new logo made, and the woman who made that was from Pakistan. She spoke English, but the way people comprehend language sometimes is a little different, and there was a little bit of a communication we kind of had to go around the tree a couple of times before I got exactly what I wanted her to do. So I'm not saying you can't get a good deal and quality product from somebody out of the country, but when I went to the uh, video, I looked for somebody in America because I knew we understand English the same way. But uh, if you want to use that, they have people who will edit your book. They have people who will design book covers. They have, I mean, just everything. If you want to check out the site, it's F-I-V-E-R-R dot com. Okay, we're going to start critique groups so that we can help each other perfect our writing. I've never formally studied writing. I learned how to write in a secular critique group. And we were somewhat brutal on each other, which to me is not the best way to go about it, but we were a secular critique group. <laughs> But I did learn a lot just from us talking about each other's writing and what we thought was strong, what we thought was weak. But before we, we implement that in this group, and we will talk about how we want to implement it after I teach you a little bit about the art of critiquing. A friend told me after she received her first critique from a writing group, she drove home angry. She was offended. She did not appreciate the feedback on how her manuscript could be improved. She was positive they did not know what they were talking about, and so upset she said, I swore I'd never return. And she cooled off, swallowed her pride, returned to the group, and remained for years. Her manuscript was eventually published by a traditional publisher. On the acknowledgement page, I know because I have a copy of the book, I was one of those people who offended her. <laughs> On the acknowledgement page, she thanked everyone in the group, the group she was angry with after her first critique. 
She thanked them for the bits and pieces of suggestions that ended up on the pages of her book. Her book won a Crystal Kite Award from the Society of Children's Writers and Illustrators. If uncomfortable feedback dissuades you from seeking help with your writing, you might miss the prize of an award-winning novel. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Also applicable to women, as a woman thinks in her heart, so is she. The words we, we write begin where? Thoughts in our heart. They're a part of us. Our writing reflects who we are. When someone says something negative about our writing, it's easy to perceive the comment as a personal attack. And what do you do when you feel attacked? You go into defense mode. The reaction is to defend yourself. And sometimes people get hurt when that happens. That is why an essential element to a critique group being successful is writers who are not easily offended and when they are offended, they're quick to forgive. And that should be easy as us for Christians, because we are taught to forgive. But there is an art to critiquing that goes beyond sharing a subjective opinion that is influenced by personal feelings about writing and our preferences in reading. None of the critique groups I have attended offered instruction on how to give a critique. We were thrown into the deep end of the pool to sink or swim. I believe we can avoid some problems if we simply take the time to first study how to evaluate a writer's work. Specific to our group, we have a goal that transcends human reasonings for writing, not that the human reasons are wrong. It's just that we are Christians. The tagline for Southern Christian writers is writing to honor God. That goal defines how we should critique each other's work. We honor God when we encourage each other, not when we tear each other down. We honor God when we encourage each other to pursue God's desire and purpose for their writing. I write today because of one word encouragement because I never had a passion for writing I had been teaching for five years and I loved it and I didn't want to stop when I was left with nothing but writing every little bump in the road was a reason to quit <laughs> a few years ago I was one of three people asked to speak about writing during the opening introduction at a writer's conference. We had 10 minutes apiece to talk about an experience in writing. So I told them how I was a reluctant writer who resisted writing for many years and every bump in the road a reason to stop. And then when I learned I would have to hire someone to edit my manuscript and discovered how expensive that is, I said, well, this is the end of the road. I threw that manuscript in the closet and said, I'm done. I'm not going to spend that kind of money to edit something that may never get published or if it does get published, may never sell a copy. I'm just not going to waste my husband's money. <laughs> I was done, but God wasn't. Months later, I'm sitting in a church with a friend. She handed me an offering envelope with money in it. And I'm wondering, why are you giving this to me? Just put it in the basket. I said, well, do you want me to put this in the offering basket when it comes by? And she said, no, it's for you. And I looked at that envelope with the church name on it, and I pointed at it and said, this isn't for me. You see the name right here on the envelope? And I threw it in her lap. I said, you put that in the offering basket when it goes by. She picked it up and extended it towards me. She said, no, it's for your ministry. I thought she'd lost her mind. I, at the time, I wasn't doing anything in ministry. The door had shut on teaching, and that door was not opening again, and it was pretty clear it may never open again. And she had at that time been a student in my class, but we had both left that church. And then more than a year later, I ran into her. We were both attending the same church again. So I looked at her and told her my ministry, I don't have a ministry. You put that money in the offering basket. And she said, no, it's for your writing ministry. 
I had not seen her or talked to her for more than a year until our paths had crossed again in that new church. Nobody knew I had written a manuscript. I don't even think I told my husband I was writing a manuscript. I was writing the manuscript because I was in a depression that I couldn't teach anymore and I had to do something or lose my mind. She did not know I had quit writing. She did not know I needed money to continue and that I had refused to continue because I didn't have the money. Only God could have put it in her heart to give me money for my writing ministry, which I didn't even know I had. <laughs> you know what her obedience did? Her obedience to God encouraged me to keep writing and suggested that writing might be my calling. I took the money after she took it out of the church's offering envelope and handed me the cash. I wasn't about to take it in the church's offering envelope. And she continued from week to week to give me small offerings. And so I started matching what she gave me. And eventually we had enough. The manuscript was edited and published. So I returned to my table after telling that story to everybody at the conference. A lady at the table told me the story had encouraged her. And throughout the morning, a few more people stopped to tell me they had appreciated the story and encouraged them. But there was one person at the conference who was not encouraged by what I said. At lunch, we went to the main conference room for the keynote speaker's address. During the presentation, she took a side road to dismiss the experience that encouraged me to keep writing. She said, writing's not a ministry. You either write or you don't. Well, that was discouraging, <laughs> coming from a, a well-known famous author and a little humiliating in front of, you know, the conference and someone of her stature announcing that I, I was wrong. And I thought, well, maybe I am. She's a successful writer selling thousands of books. I've never sold thousands of books. Maybe writing is not something God calls you to do as a ministry, which gave me an excuse quit writing again. She sat down and a literary agent spoke next. His family had been in Christian publishing for generations and at one time they owned the largest Christian publishing house in the world. He was in the audience when I spoke. He was also in the audience when she dismissed the idea that writing could be a ministry. He didn't agree with her comment and made it clear in his presentation that writing is a ministry and people are called to write. So who should I believe? One author who discouraged and humiliated me before the entire conference or a literary agent whose family had been in Christian publishing for generations? To me, two confirmations that this is what God wants me to do trumped one person's opinion that it isn't. Who should you listen to? The people who discourage you and tear you down or the people who encourage you and build you up? Clearly her experience in writing was different than mine, but that did not mean one of us was right and one of us was wrong. It just meant that God's plan for our lives is different and some people who are struggling need stronger affirmation and encouragement than others. It wasn't that I was anything special above God, above any of his other children. It's just that I wasn't there. I was having a hard time accepting it, didn't want to do it, so he gave me a little extra to push me down the road. I believe writing can be a calling and a ministry, but I do not believe it has to be. If you're a Christian with a love and a passion for writing, you should write regardless of your reason. Our gifts and abilities come from God, so honor Him with what He gave you. Right? Because there is power in words. Jesus is identified as the Word. The Apostle John opened his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Words are so powerful, it produced an idea that became a phrase most people are familiar with and would agree with. The pen is mightier than the sword. That saying was made famous by Edward Bueller Lighton in Act Two of Lighton's 1839 play, Richelieu. 
Cardinal Richelieu discovers his friend and confidant was plotting against him. As a priest, he could not challenge that friend to a fistfight. So his servant suggested there are other weapons he could use, and he replied, True that, beneath the rule of men entirely great, the pen is mightier than the sword. How many of you have ever heard the first phrase of that sentence? We just hear the last, right? But there was more to the idea. Lighton's play made the latter phrase of that sentence popular, but he was not the first to put the idea in writing. He didn't form the idea. The idea had been around for a long time. Thomas Jefferson sent a letter to Thomas Paine in 1796 in which he wrote, Go on doing with your pen what in other times was done with the sword. Before Jefferson, Robert Burton in The Anatomy of Melancholy, published in 1621, wrote, A blow with a word strikes deeper than a blow with a sword. In Burton's day, that idea was already an old saying. A similar phrase appears in George Whetstone's Civil Discourses, published in 1582. The dash of a pen is more grievous than the counter use of a lance. This idea existed 1,500 years before Whetstone wrote it in Civil Discourses. Does anyone know who may have wrote it before they did, where that idea probably originated? The Bible. Hebrews 4.12 for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Writing does not trump the power of a sword unless we are entirely great, like God is. No one is God's equal in the great department, but God can inspire us to write his ideas that are sharper than a two-edged sword. In fact, we can become great. Does anybody know how? Hmm? <laughs> well, yes, but I'm going to go with King David in Psalms 1835. David said to God, Thy gentleness has made me great. There is a reason God puts great value on a gentle and quiet spirit. There is a reason the Bible challenges us to be completely humble and gentle. <coughs> gentleness nourishes greatness. If we treat one another gently, like God treats us, we can encourage each other down the path to great writing that has the power to knock down strongholds of human reasonings that are contrary to the truth. Great writing that has the power to destroy false arguments made about God. Great writing with the power to abolish proud thoughts that blind people from knowing God. The art of critiquing can be defined in one word, gentleness. And when we begin to move into the critiquing of each other's words, the critiquing of each other's writing, we will practice gentleness. The way we feel about a person's writing is not an accurate measure of good writing. Writing defined as good in the 1800s, even the early 1900s, with its long narration, you know, and run-on sentences that look like paragraphs might have flunked the English classes I took in school in the late 60s and 70s. Lighton, who wrote The Pen is Mightier Than the Sword, was a popular novelist in his day. He also gave us It Was a Dark and Stormy Night. A familiar opening sentence used by Snoopy in the Peanuts comic strip. The reason that was in there, why they had Snoopy writing that, because today that is considered the worst opening sentence to ever be in a novel. There's even a contest sponsored by a university in San Jose to see who can write as bad an opening sentence as Lighton did. Well, it wasn't a terrible opening sentence to a novel in his generation. 
he made a living writing. Few people make a living writing, trust me. But today it is. So let me ask you, who makes these decisions? And what authority do they have to do to change what's considered good writing and what's considered bad writing? The rules that govern good and bad writing change with the seasons. At one time, it was forbidden to start a sentence with a conjunction, and, or but. Within my lifetime, that has changed, and I'll prove it to you. This is the advocate, front page, story, opening the sentence to a paragraph. But the reality is that Edwards win. Starts with a conjunction. And that wasn't a misprint, where they should have a comma, because open to the next page, Another paragraph, opening sentence, and the International Committee of the Red Cross. It's acceptable today to do it. But when I was in school, I'd get marks off if I did it. <laughs> and it's not really the first time that rule has changed. Every sentence in the first chapter of the King James Bible begins with the conjunction and, except for one sentence that begins with so. This is the King James Bible. Who makes up these rules and who changes them? I had a conversation with a writing friend about adverbs that end in L-Y, gladly, sadly, happily, thankfully. Her position, using L-Y words is just bad writing. You must not say he hurriedly walked to his destination, just say he ran to his destination. The book that was selling millions of copies at the time were the Harry Potter books. So I read the first chapter in Harry Potter book to see if she used adverbs that ended in L-Y, and I counted 15 in the first chapter. J.K. Rowling is one of the richest authors in the world, and here's someone telling me that her writing is bad? I recently listened to 24 lectures on the subject of the sentence. Who knew you could have that many lectures on the sentence? by Dr. Brooks Landon, the director of the University of Iowa's General Education Literature Program. The university was the original developer of the Master of Fine Arts degree, and it operates the world-renowned Iowa Writers Workshop, which has produced 17 of the university's 46 Pulitzer Prize winners. Dr. Landon concluded the lectures on the sentence with a discussion about assembling sentences into a paragraph, and I found what he had to say fascinating. The definition of a paragraph that is generally treated as a mandate from God and has been taught for a century and was taught to me came to us from English composition and rhetoric written in 1866 by Alexander Bain. Bain defined the paragraph as the division of discourse next higher than the sentence, and is a collection of sentences with unity of purpose. Bain gave us six principles that govern the structure, of, the structure of a paragraph. By the 1970s, the six principles were reduced to three. And those three were unity, coherence, and emphasis. In other words, a paragraph is a topic sentence and all the following sentences should be on the topic and that makes sense to me. But according to Professor Landon, and now this is a quote. Landon said, Bain got it wrong. His errors have been mechanically, if not mindlessly, passed down as the received truths of paragraph theory. He went on to say, there's nothing wrong with doing it Bain's way, except, and this is another quote, what he said word for word, it, meaning your paragraph, will be an artificial structure that forces your writing style into a box made long ago by one self-trained rhetorician at the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. And if you go looking for examples that will fit this prescriptive model, you are most certain to find them since this model has been forced on writing students for nearly 150 years. But the odds are you won't find paragraphs by celebrated or even your favorite writers that fit this mold talking about today. Ouch. This is taught in a university that has produced 46 Pulitzer Prize winners. Clearly the way to construct paragraphs have shifted out of the box. Why is Bain wrong? Why wasn't he wrong when he originally defined the paragraph 150 years ago? 
And what makes Professor Landon right and Bain wrong? Right? Adhering to a set of rules that define good writing does not produce great literature. Great ideas produce great literature. Ideas that capture the imagination, ideas that meet the needs of the reader, ideas that transform nations define great writing. Because writing is subjective and rules of good writing tend to fluctuate, when we offer a critique, it is our goal to gently offer suggestions and observations that will help the writer communicate so their ideas are clear, easy to read, easy to understand. It is not our goal to destroy creativity by debating rules. The communication of an idea is more important than arguing about whether you can start a sentence with a conjunction, or if you can use an L-Y word to describe action, or if your paragraph is properly constructed. So the art of the critique is gentleness. The thing about laws, rules, it's, they tend to confine you. They tend to inhibit creativity. There is a reason that God is moving towards a time when he's going to do away with the law. We're under grace now, but according to Revelations, that hasn't the law, which really only applies to the nation of Israel, because they are the ones that agreed to live by the law. Well, one day he's going to take that burden off their back. Okay, when giving a critique, you should begin with a summary of what you got from the work. State what you thought the story was about and what the author was trying to accomplish with it. This lets the author know how well he or she was able to communicate the story's key themes to you. And that's really the most important thing that you're communicating, that you can be understood. Address your critique to the manuscript, not to the writer. Comments within the critique should be made in the nature of either this section needs or I didn't understand this sentence or this paragraph confused me. Don't tell the writer you need to. It is their decision, not ours. They decide what needs to be changed based on the group's collective feedback. Start with the positive. Point out the author's strengths with a specific example, such as, I like the details about your characters. You made them come alive. If it's nonfiction, you might want to point out something you learned that you didn't know or didn't see in, in that perspective before and how it changed your way of thinking. After you have encouraged the author, then point to something that needs work. Starting with positive feedback sets a helpful tone to a critique and makes it easier to accept something you say that might be negative. Then go ahead and point to something that might need work, but don't overload the author with negative feedback. If there is a lot that needs work, start with one thing, and don't move on until the author has mastered that one thing. Let them progress slowly, mastering one thing at a time so they don't feel overloaded and discouraged. If you point to something that needs work, you also need to tell them why and offer a solution. If someone has a problem using quotes in dialogue, recommend a book on punctuation that helped you bring, that helped you, or bring an address to a website or a blog that deals with that topic. We don't want to just tell them this is wrong and not give them an idea on how they can fix it. Right? right? Yeah. Finally, do not judge a person's theology. We have people from various denominations with various beliefs, we all agree that Jesus is Lord, but then there are some things that we may not agree on, but that doesn't justify treating them with a lack of respect. We're really not here to do a Bible study. Therefore, we do not correct each other's theology. If it is theology that you find disagreeable, you are not obligated to read it, you are not obligated to offer a critique, and you are not obligated to explain why. You can just say, I don't have a critique on that. And that's all we need to know. Now, guidelines for receiving a critique. 
I'm sorry, I got that backwards. Guidelines for submitting a critique. <laughs> when you submit something to be critiqued, be specific. You might not want the whole thing critiqued. You might be looking for something in particular. There are really three types of edits that a manuscript goes through before it's published. There is the contextual edit that looks at the big picture. Do I have a beginning, middle, and a satisfying ending? Is the pace too slow? Is the pace too fast? Did the author leave out important information that I needed to know to understand what came next? Or did they include a bunch of irrelevant information that got me sidetracked and I lost interest in reading it? Then it goes to a grammar or copy edit. There are different names for all these levels. That narrows the focus to the structure of your sentences, punctuation, proper word usage. Did they write H-E-R-E -E and when they were, should have said H-E-A-R, those kinds of things? and it checks the accuracy of references, etc. The final edit that a book goes through is proofreading, and basically, basically that catches everything missed in the previous edits. But you really need to get the big picture fixed first before you start correcting all the grammar, because then you might delete two or three paragraphs that you wasted your time fixing the grammar on. So get the big picture down first. Second, respect the person giving the critiquer giving the critique. That person took time to read your work and form suggestions that might help you communicate your ideas and refine what you wrote. They do not deserve to be interrupted or corrected. Whether you agree with the things they say or not, you ask for an opinion. They might not be right, but they took the time to do something for free that you could be paying a lot of money for. A professional edit on 50,000 words, which is about a 200-page book, can run as high as $5,000. Wow. A professional edit. And you get what you pay for. Three, be slow to change what you wrote. If you rewrite something based on one opinion, I guarantee you, you'll find someone with a different opinion and you will be constantly rewriting and it will make you crazy. <laughs> you will never satisfy everybody so you satisfy what's in your heart to write. Just listen quietly to each person and if two or more say the same thing, then you might need to take a look at that and decide if it needs to be changed. 